Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Quant University Spring School. And uh, today we are fortunate to have a wonderful group of panelists who I really respect and I've worked with them. Uh, each one of them has a tremendous experience in various areas in finance, but the whole notion of AI and model risk are near and dear to my heart and near and dear to every of the panelists' heart. So they spend more than 50 hours thinking about responsible adoption of algorithmic models in their work practices. And they come from various perspectives, from a technology a provider's perspective, from a consulting perspective, from a bank's perspective, and also a technology vendor's perspective. So I'm very excited about today's discussion. Uh, welcome again, everyone. So as you all know, Quant University has been hosting these uh, weekly lecture series uh, since May of 2020, since COVID hit. And uh, I was just counting, and we have had more than 60 speakers and uh, more than 40 sessions over time. So I'm very uh, much um, uh, in gratitude to all the speakers who take their time off and come down to these sessions and present their views and also engage in discussion. Um, as you all know, my name is uh, Shri Krishnamurti. I run a company called uh, Quant University. We're based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, this week, as was telling Agus and others, we had hopefully our final snow of the season and we are looking forward to the sun. It's 74 degrees outside and I'm looking forward to taking a jog outside. Um, we are also uh, working with a lot of uh, different entities, uh, including Premier, and other uh, companies wherein we provide uh, consulting and also advisory services. And we are building what's called as Q-Sandbox, which is our way of um, uh, working with uh, making responsible AI pragmatic. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about it as we go through the discussion. A uh, Couple of quick announcements. If you do not know about the Spring School and you are joining in for the first time, uh, please go to qspringschool.splashthat.com. We host weekly lectures. And we also engage in conversations on AI, explainability, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also have formal courses if you're in the, uh, in the mode of learning new concepts, especially in the context of AI, risk management, machine learning, and also adoption of various technologies from, a, from the prism of a financial professional. Uh, we also have partnered with Premier and we offer multiple courses with them. And if you are a premium member, you get special discounts if you take courses with us and also get professional learning credits for any of the courses you take. And we have also made many of these courses self-serve. So as you can see, there are people from multiple parts of the world joining us. So you should be able to take any of these courses at your own leisure. <clears throat> we also started two new courses, one called the algorithmic auditing course. And uh, Agus and I, we were having discussion whether it's model risk or no. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, kind of come up with a framework on how do you think about auditing machine learning and AI models. And uh, we also have a course on uh, how do you think about stress testing, scenario testing, and evaluation when it comes to machine learning models. So all these uh, course information are available on the Quant University website. You're welcome to uh, join us. And also, if you have any questions, please reach out to us and we'll be able to share, um, um, share information about the courses. Uh, so today's panel, I will, uh, without, in the next couple of minutes, I will introduce you to the, the panelists. Uh, next week, we have uh, a seminar on uh, monitoring machine learning systems in production. Uh, Elena and Emily, they've been working on an open source product called uh, Evidently on uh, monitoring, and they're gonna do a couple of demos. So it should be a fun exercise to see how you can uh, leverage open source tooling to build out some dashboards. And then uh, there's another uh, in the same realm, uh, uh, explainability dashboard, which is being built by Ogi. Uh, he's based out of Amsterdam and uh, he's gonna be talking about uh, the explainability dashboard. And then uh, Jacobo, who is currently in Milan, uh, he's gonna be talking about uh, serverless data ops from data to documentation. And he has been working on automating various pieces with weights and biases and uh, um, uh, ML flow and uh, a couple of other tools. So he's going to talk about from a pragmatic perspective, how do you put all these things together? So uh, three sessions to get hands-on, roll up your sleeves and learn something new. 
And again, all these lectures will be available on QDOT Academy if you want to catch up on any of the lectures you missed. So um, without further ado, I want to kind of set a preamble on today's discussion before we uh, get into the thing. So as you all know, in the last uh, few weeks, there's been a flurry of activities with respect to regulating financial uh, institutions and also various aspects of use cases uh, through various federal organizations. Uh, the first one is this RFI, which has come out. I don't know how many of you are uh, aware of it. And um, what we did was we just basically summarized some of the things we observed as a part of the, uh, the RFI and uh, it's in the slides I'll be sharing with you. Uh, but um, over time, as you all know, uh, there has always been this interest of getting the regulator's perspective or what does it mean to regulate um, artificial intelligence and use of machine learning within financial organizations. And this time around five organizations, the controller of um, the currency, the OCC, the Federal Reserve System, the FDIC, uh, the CFPB, and also the NCUA, they all come together and they'll put up this um, RFI, <clears throat> something uh, uh, which everybody should be um, looking at. Now, uh, that's where we started engaging Patrick and uh, uh, I and Nick and August, we started discussing like, well, should we have a panel to uh, talk about like, you know, what does it actually mean? Is the timing right? Or do we already have the mechanisms to, uh, to basically uh, build upon what we have already been building in the financial industry for so long? And also when I started discussing with Tulsi, who's uh, at Google, um, so we started thinking about like, how do we position all these things from various perspectives and thought we'll have a fun discussion. It's one among the many discussions we'll have in the future as this RFI matures and there's gonna be more discussion. A couple of other uh, things to note, there is also a draft uh, EU regulation of AI uh, document, which is floating around. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be the final one or close to final one, but in the last week, that's another document, which I would recommend if you're interested to understand it. Um, the point here is like, as AI and machine learning has become more and more uh, ubiquitous within financial institutions, there has been a question of what's the role of risk? What's the role of you know, development and uh, IT and model ops and tooling and cloud and everything? So we're trying to see how we can you know, mature the discussion to the next front so that we can kind of bring in all the views and uh, go towards some sensible uh, legislation in the near future. So that's kind of the preamble. And uh, I have another 30 plus slides, which basically summarizes all these uh, points. But uh, welcome panelists. Agus, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Thank you for the uh, session. So um, I think uh, we'll take like a minute to um, have everybody introduce themselves. I'm just going to you know, put the screen in here for a second and then um, um, I will briefly introduce you. And then if you could introduce yourselves, um, that'll be very much appreciated. So Agus, as you all know, is at uh, Wells Fargo. He heads uh, corporate model risk. So Agus, um, please tell about like what, what brought you into this whole area of AI risk and how did you get started with, uh, uh, you know, bringing in machine learning and technology and risk from the perspective of the banking industry? Well, the uh, bank is, uh, has been uh, traditionally using a lot of model, right? So uh, we always, uh, is some kind of like bank runs by model. Uh, everything that we do, we have models and uh, in a very, very large model inventory for, for complex institution, of course, with a, lot, a lot of model, uh, very complex inventory. So uh, we're looking at uh, machine learning is just the uh, another tool for us that, that, that we use that, that, that help us to uh, to do something that's somewhat more sophisticated and uh, less manual. So so that kind of things the uh, that we do. So it's just very natural for us because Bang has been dabbling with the uh, uh, with the uh, with with statistical techniques and mathematical finance for a long time. Perfect. Thank you, Agus. Welcome. Um, so our next panelist is Patrick Hall, and uh, I've known Patrick for many years, even though I did not know him in person. Um, I was always uh, enamored with all the cool documents which would come out of h2o.ai, and I would share it with my students at Northeastern saying, well, if you want a tutorial on explainability, here's a document you can go read. It's required reading for your class. And uh, I also was very much impressed with some of the 
uh, the, the ability to kind of digest some of the complex concepts and make it easily accessible. Uh, but Patrick wears multiple hats now. So he's working with bnh.ai. And uh, so he's kind of uh, in the frontier of you know, engaging in responsible AI through incident reporting, through various aspects of algorithmic auditing, but also bringing in the legal perspective. So welcome, Patrick. So how did you get involved with AI and risk? And uh, do you want to give a brief summary of like, you know, all the cool things you've been working on? Yeah, sure. And, and I'll, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, the, the, the reason I got involved with AI risk actually goes back to my time at SAS. And I really like to uh, highlight and, and call out my, my colleagues at SAS for uh, basically understanding for a long time how companies have made money with data and, and imparting that understanding to me. And so sort of in the early 2010s, we were running into this issue where people wanted to use machine learning, but it was either too complex it was, it was too complex to either be deployed or to be explained. And, uh, you know, so, so flew all around the world, you know, just, just running into this problem again and again and again, machine learning can't be deployed, machine learning can't be explained. So, so I'd say that was, that was uh, you know, how I did my toes in this. And obviously I got really into the explainability part. And uh, after that went on and, and led responsible AI efforts at h2o.ai. Um, there, I, I saw that, that people can deploy machine learning finally, but uh, there are some real serious legal liabilities associated with using machine learning, especially in different regulated industries, employment, banking, uh, insurance, healthcare to a certain degree, probably others. And so now I focus on, on trying to help companies from a technical and legal perspective deal with all kinds of liabilities around AI, Any, anything from algorithmic discrimination to security, data privacy, um, you know, broad spectrum of, of AI risk that I'm sure we'll talk about today. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome. Um, so our next panelist is uh, Tulsi. So Tulsi leads uh, responsible AI efforts at Google, and uh, she's been engaged in multiple products uh, and projects. Uh, some of them include model cards, uh, fact sheets, and um, uh, data sheets for various models. Um, so Tulsi also has this perspective of you know, how do you kind of bring in this whole tooling infrastructure, TensorFlow and all the machine learning tools which are being put by Google, but also looking at how do you enable adoption and make this pragmatic from an industry perspective. So welcome Tulsi. So how did you get involved with uh, Responsible AI? So do you wanna share your story? Thank you. Yeah, so um, I guess as, as Sri mentioned, I lead currently the product side of Google's Responsible AI efforts. And so that means I both work across our product teams across Google to think about what Responsible AI means for our products, but then also bring back those insights um, in terms of building out tools within the TensorFlow ecosystem, within our cloud ecosystem um, for, for actually thinking about Responsible AI and product development. And for me, I think the journey was really through product, right? So I actually was a product manager for Google search and then for YouTube recommendations. And it was through my work in the products that I started to see opportunities for more responsible AI work, right? In terms of thinking about what does it mean to make our products more inclusive? What does it mean to think about robustness and security in our products? How do we think about transparency and explainability? And as we started to do that work on YouTube, um, started realizing that there's a lot more opportunity, obviously across the industry, but just even within Google for centralizing some of our knowledge, building out a more robust kind of um, center of excellence really for, for building that up and for uh, taking a lot of the research that our amazing researchers in responsible AI were doing and figuring out how to translate that into best practices for our product teams and for tooling. And so as Sri mentioned, uh, you know, now I work on a number of different pieces like model cards, which think about transparency and of course came from a very foundation research background um, but also, you know, how do we think about metrics that can actually measure some of these approaches and opportunities in product and, and build ways for product managers and engineers on the ground to actually implement some of the insights. Awesome. Welcome, Tulsi. Uh, and you. our uh, final speaker, Nick Schmidt. So he, uh, so apologies, Nick, uh, we weren't fast enough to update your resume. Uh, <laughs> Nick has a new role. So there is a spin art from PLDS called Solus.ai. And uh, Nick is, um, is also a, a veteran in the context of uh, AI and machine learning practice. And uh, I got introduced to Nick's work from both Patrick and also from uh, 
Raghu Kulkarni, who was also one of our speakers uh, from Discover. And uh, they have a really cool paper on uh, machine learning, which I would highly recommend everyone to read. And uh, we have been speaking multiple uh, times. And um, uh, I think in the context of responsible AI and discrimination and looking at um, you know, uh, the whole area of credit risk, I think Nick has been uh, consulting for various companies and now uh, he's been working on a new project, Solus. So Nick, welcome. And do you want to tell about your new initiative? Sure, thank you. And, and so my background is really as more of an applied economist. And I started my career working on employment discrimination analyses. So when a company would be sued by a group of employees, we would get their human resources databases and run traditional statistical models on them to see whether or not there was evidence of discrimination. And if there was, what needed to be done to even things out. And out of that, um, the out of the employment law context, fair lending law and practices within institutions for understanding fair lending uh, were brought in. And I moved into that area and really got involved in algorithmic fairness related primarily to fair lending. And Shortly after I joined the company, a number of our clients got into machine learning in a, to a degree that they hadn't been before. And they said, we don't want to get sued. And so what should we do about it? And out of that came our software. And what it does is it takes concepts from law and regulation and standard best practices for compliance, applies those to machine learning, AI, traditional algorithms, and assesses whether or not there's evidence of discrimination. And if there is, comes up with an alternative model that might have features or hyperparameters or whatever it may be tweaked a bit so that it's still just as predictive, essentially, very close to that, but has less discrimination or, in, or none is the ideal outcome. Uh, and so that's what the software does, and, and we're using it with a, a number of uh, major institutions now. Yeah, so welcome, Nick. Um, so Thank let's you. get to our first formal question. So I hope everybody has had a chance to uh, at least go through the, the, the RFI. Um, I want to take a minute for each one of you to share your views on, you know, where does the the RFI and the associated uh, you know, summary and the concerns and um, things which are mentioned in the document hit the mark. And where do you think you know, it's, it's something we should, we should still work on and the RFI is probably not covering all the bases. So August, do you wanna go first? <clears throat> uh, sure, well, we, we have a lot of discussion with the regulator the last uh, couple of years, right? So uh, I, I look at it, the, my view on the RFI is just the, uh, it's the forma formalization of what they have been asking to us. They have been examining many, many banks, right? So, so the, uh, their work in the last three, two, three years, examining various banks, particularly large banks, how they manage mm -hmm. AI and machine learning, the type of question they ask during examination or ongoing supervision. That's what came out uh, as in the, uh, in the RFI. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise. It's not the first time we, 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 we see it because it has been ongoing the last few years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Patrick, from your perspective, when you look at it from, you know, from a risk and also from a legal liability perspective, um, do you think there is enough information in the RFI which covers many of the risks current and also the, the near term future risks which are gonna come with respect to the adoption of machine learning and AI? So I was happy to see the uh, section on cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just hear such mixed messages um, from people in the industry as, as to whether uh, this, this is a real threat or not. But I'll tell you that over say the past year, it's gone from uh, being like, no, that you're, you're crazy, this is crazy, you know, this is sci-fi stuff to uh, people, you know, I'd say about 50% of the people now uh, are actually concerned about security issues around their machine learning models, which do uh, exhibit some particular and specific uh, security vulnerabilities that, that likely need to be mitigated. 
Um, so very happy to see that. One thing that, that you know I didn't see enough of was the notion of instant response, and, and that's probably a, a <laughs> obvious response, you know, from given our conversations before. But um, you know, when we when we think about traditional models they used in in, in credit risk, they're they're highly targeted to very narrow context, right? Like <laughs> um, prime market. Uh, you know, these states, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Narrow down the context. That's where machine learning really succeeds. Um, when, we, when we move into these broader sort of robotics process automation chatbot type systems, then the context explodes, right? The, the context in which the AI system operates explodes. And I would, I would contend that you really can't even foresee all the risk and, and hence the, the ability to respond to glitches or smaller incidents before they explode into much larger incidents becomes more important when AI is operating in these broader sort of robotic RPA, robotic process automation and, and chatbot mm -hmm. context. So leave my comments at that for now. Cool. Um, so Tulsi, uh, you've been working with uh, you know, the Google team and also with, you probably also looked at other tools in the context of explainability, et cetera. So, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, the coverage of explainability? And I think there are a couple of questions which are related in this, in this uh, RFI. Uh, do you think uh, this is going to suffice with respect to the discussion? And again, Agus and I, we have had multiple discussions on the context of explainability versus interpretability and the state of the art and what's, uh, what is required versus what is, uh, what is something which uh, is still very nascent. So what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think what always interests me, and I think you kind of touched on this a little bit when we use the word explainability, is I think we use the word explainability to mean a wide range of things that are actually all very different, right? And I think sometimes explainability is used in in as another word for transparency, right? Which is less, can you explain a, for example, single model decision, but can you explain how the model was created, what it is, what the data looks like, um, what the limitations of the model are? Sometimes we talk about explainability as explainability to an end user, right? So if you have a decision that is being made, how do you explain that in a way that is human understandable uh, or even regulator understandable? And then sometimes we talk about explainability as like, can a, de a developer debug what happened when a model performs incorrectly? And I think all of those require actually different techniques, different approaches and different technology. I think the RFI like, isn't it isn't clear to me when when we're asking necessarily about lack of um, explainability or some of the risks related to explainability where exactly we are leaning and I think it's probably alluding to some degree to all three um, I think the the one that is easiest to address in some sense is developer interpretability and debugability not because the techniques are necessarily fully formed I think there's a lot of research still to do but because a lot of that work can happen at the at the level of context that a developer has, which is a lot of context, right? And so even techniques that are basic or only provide you partial information um, can get you a long way to, to understand and debug and improve your model. Whereas I think when we start talking about transparency and accountability to external users, the bar has to be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can we'll I, actually can I um, yeah, please. share one thing that I think will be helpful to everyone there? Um, NIST, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, just put out an excellent draft on the psycho psychological foundations of the differences between explainability and interpretability, um, which I which I found to be just just really smart commentary. So I'm going to put that link in the in the chat and just uh, and, and be quiet again. Oh, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, so uh, Nick, um, there are a couple of different applications which are listed in this RFI. Um, do you think that kind of gives you enough in the context of the possible applications, the credit decisions, personalization, flagging unusual transactions, risk management in general, textual uh, analysis, and also cybersecurity? Um, now, explicit aspects of discrimination aren't mentioned in here, but what are your thoughts about like how does this whole thing would fit in? in some of the areas you're working on? I think, so So, I thought that this RFI was really good and it covered a lot of, of bases that, that I actually wasn't expecting. Their, their point on overfitting, uh, for mm -hmm. instance, I, would, I did not expect that. And, and that's clearly an issue in ML and AI. In terms of the applications they outlined uh, that you just reiterated, that's exactly what I see our clients using and 
the most interesting one on the horizon that's really, I think, just coming out, or at least it is just coming to fair lending reviews, is using natural language processing for things like emotion detection uh, and using that to root calls. Uh, that has a potential to be extremely problematic because judging someone's emotions by the by their words or their voice is heavily culturally dependent. Mm -hmm. And so me angry may sound different than the rest of you sounding angry. And if I'm getting an unfavorable outcome because I sound angry or I'm getting a favorable outcome, you know, I'm getting extra attention. That means whoever did not get flagged that way is getting an unfavorable outcome. And so there's a real risk of, bad models, not because of bad data so much, but insufficient data, or just there's too broad of uh, uh, possibilities in, not, in such that you can't really make a good model. Um, and, and those are where some really interesting fair lending risks are coming up that I don't think people have addressed that much. Mm -hmm. And I see that, that being an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Agus, um, self-policing versus oversight by third parties. What should be the spectrum, especially when the use cases are so diverse and so broad? Should it be application by application? Should it be institution by institution based on the size of the institutions? Or should it be you know, concept by concept where you're looking at, oh, explainability, Here's like a framework, do this. Oh, but you can also do other things, but this is like the minimum. What are your thoughts? Uh, let me say this one in terms of for financial institution, for some of you that's not familiar with financial institution. We have so many check and checker checking the checks, right? Ch checking the checker. We have model developer on model owner. That's what we call it. That's the first line we call it, yeah. And then we have second line who's independent report to completely different chain until very, very high level, right? So I, uh, I run the second line. I report to the chief risk officer who report to the CEO, right? So it's very senior position and model developer and model owner report to the business, the, the other side. So mm -hmm. it's very, very independent, right? So this is the second line. And then we have the third line who's checking both of the first line and second line. That's called auditor, right? Our auditor, they are independent. They report to audit. By the way, uh, chief risk officer in the bank, they don't report to the CEO. They report to the board risk, chair of board risk committee, right? Administratively to the CEO, but the reporting is to the board. So to maintain the independent. And then credit. Is report to they don't report to CEO too. They report to the uh, the, the uh, head of uh, audit board, right? So they are the third line that's independent. And then we have the fourth line, which is our external auditor. Mm -hmm. Our external auditor checking. That's the third part. That's outside the company. They are checking. And then we have the fifth line, which is our regulator, Federal Reserve, OCC, CFPB, FDIC. They also check our model. So a financial institution have five lines because of the importance of the uh, institution, uh, particularly for systemic, large systemic institution like, 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 like Wells Fargo. So there are already infrastructure that is like that. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the importance. Sec uh, tech company may not be subjected like that, but financial institution is. So that's, uh, that's what, that's what we, we, we have. Secondly, it really, when we start talking about usage and the level of explainability, it really depends on the risk, the harm that the model will create. Mm -hmm. uh, and some will be low risk, some will be very high risk. Uh, alerting some things, you know, that the investigator will look at, it's very different than it's on the, on the credit decision. Credit decision, uh, decide the future economic ability and financial ability of people in the long run. And not only that, because of 
the, the nature of what we do, it impact how the society be involved in the economic equality of mm -hmm. the future. So the, the, the check, the, uh, the, the importance of all this transparency and explainability is very, very wide in terms of uh, application. So I think people need to, to think that way and put it in, in, in perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, again, probably, um, do you have any thoughts on that, Patrick? Because I'm always struggling, you know, should we have like a SR11 7.ai, if you will, you know, which is well, going to like lay out like a whole set of, this is what you got to do, this is what you got to do, this is something you're going to cover, and then go with like, okay, I'm covering this, I'm covering this. So what are your thoughts there? Sure. So, so if we're talking about this issue of, um, external oversight, and I'll, I'll jump to SR117 in just a moment. Um, you know, I, I would say that the, the FTC, which isn't a regulator that we're talking about right now, but a regulator that, that might be involved in the future um, and, and is involved throughout the economy and has been saber rattling on, on enforcement around AI since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, actually. Um, the FTC on two occasions now has said bring in outside experts or consider bringing in outside experts to, to audit your AI. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that just having an outside expert objective opinion, it's always good is that, you know, depending on what kind of institution you are, second, third, fourth, fifth line check. Um, I think one thing that, that Nick and I have, have learned about a lot is the importance of legal privilege when, when bringing in outside um, auditors and and so I would I would draw that to people's attention that that um, it can be important to you know so that you don't hurt yourself when you're trying to do the right thing to bring in the correct privilege mechanisms if possible to um, to to have your audit uh, result in in sort of the the, the safest type of information discovery um, mm -hmm. transitioning over to to SR117 I think SR117 basically works for, for machine learning models. I mean, I, I'd love to hear, a goo, you know, a goose knows way more than me about SR117, but I think, I think SR117 basically works for machine learning models. Again, where I get concerned is when we start talking about AI systems, right? Like systems that are making broad decisions in a broad context, a broad set of decisions in a broad set of context. And for that types of, of application, I, I do think there could be new regulatory guidance needed. Um, but, but just in terms of, you know, switching from linear model to gradient boosting, I, I think that, that SR117 largely holds. Right, absolutely. And again, that's, that's one of the concerns I have too, in the context of, you know, you got to draw a line on like, are you just talking about models or you're talking about systems? Because systems incorporate both the technology aspects of it, the decision-making aspects of it, the business rules, the <laughs> the area you are in and all the other aspects. So that, you know, again, uh, Tulsi, you have a perspective wherein, you know, you have a lot of companies, you know, putting in uh, different infrastructure on your cloud, but also thinking about, you know, expanding the, the, the way in which they model using various technologies. So how, how do you look at, you know, regulation in, in, from your perspective? Is it something wherein, uh, August was talking about uh, you know different levels, right? So is that something where there would be like some kind of a standard saying, okay, this is certified to this particular level, this is like this particular technical readiness level, etc. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think so. You know, I think all the speakers have sort of alluded to this, which is I, there's so much context dependent as we build these systems out and as you define for product versus system versus model, right? And so, you know, a model may work per perfectly well in a particular context and in a particular evaluation. You now add business logic and other decisions, or you deploy it in a particular way to users, or users engage with it in a particular way, and the soundness of that original measurement. Does doesn't actually hold anymore, right? And so I think, you know, I, I think that it's important that we have consistent standards and consistent metrics because I think it's important for people to understand at least baselines that you need to hit and understand. But I think things get scary when it, we go towards a world where that's the only thing that you measure or hold yourself accountable to, right? So I think the metrics that we create should be standards and baselines, but should not be the whole story. And we should make sure that, and this is where I get even nervous about checklists and things like that, because 
I find that often when we provide those even to product teams, there's a sense of like, okay, if I do these five things, I'm good, right? I've, I've solved the problem. And that doesn't even get to some of Nick's concerns that he raised earlier around like cultural context and the fact that when you solve, a, when you evaluate a certain set of things for a particular data set or for a particular context, it may not work as well in other contexts or for other users. And so that's a very long way of saying, I think we do need to develop a certain set of metrics for certain types of use cases, right? So for example, saying, hey, in the credit use cases, um, here are the right sets of metrics uh, for these particular types of models and, and types of structures. And we believe that you should measure these types of things. Um, but acknowledging the fact that this is gonna be a continued area of research and that there's going to be work that is gonna need to be done above and beyond some of those basic questions. Absolutely. Uh, and so I, Nick, uh, I think I can, oh, sorry. Uh, I think I could give a, a good example of, of the problem that, that uh, Tulsi was describing. And so we have, we have as clients, lenders that are very large traditional institutions that are dealing with prime and above credit. And we also have FinTech lenders that are using alternative data trying to get down to people who do not have credit scores. Mm -hmm. Now, the, in the former category, the variable review and the, the variables that a modeler can get their hands on are highly reviewed for any potential discriminatory effect such that by the time it gets to the modeler, it's pretty squeaky clean. On the other hand, fintechs that are using alternative data, those variables just have higher disparate impact. There is, there is almost always going to be more diff larger differences by race or ethnicity. But those variables also allow extension to credit to groups that wouldn't have it otherwise. Now, if you have a standard that regulators set for model quality drop for improvement in disparity. Mm -hmm. Those two banks are, they, the numbers do not work for them because in this super prime bank, all the variables are already reviewed. You basically can't have a model without just deteriorating it significantly uh, by dropping, you know, dropping a few variables or dropping the quality. Whereas with the, the fintech lender, very frequently there's a lot of play there in mm -hmm. terms of the accuracy fairness trade off. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example where metrics just don't, single metrics don't work. Mm -hmm. And what makes much more sense in, in my experience is having strong reporting with exceptions allowed, but the modeler has to write at least a paragraph or two about them. Mm -hmm. Because if you get a modeler to have to write a paragraph or two, they may just do the do do the other thing anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I actually had a follow-on question for you, Nick. Um, you know, I think, and probably this, you know, Patrick can, can chime in too. So I think Agus was also mentioning, you know, the fifth line of defense or the, the fourth line of defense, the external role mm -hmm. of an external auditor, right? Uh, and I mean, we we also do a lot of external model validation for clients and. We come in from the perspective of looking at both the process aspects and also the specifics. Uh, so there are two components, right? One is uh, um, the products themselves uh, are so complex that the in-house folks who are using it don't have the ability to understand all the algorithms. So they bring in subject matter expertise. Um, but there's also the delegation saying we cannot do everything. So can someone who has an independent, wearing an independent hat can do uh, more due diligence on our processes and our models. So, how do we define that in the context of requirements? In the kind, you know, if we are looking at an RFI kind of a thing, saying is that going to be mandatory? Because I think there were also some other legislations in New York and other things where they were talking about like, well, anything you develop which has like a systemic impact should be audited by a third party entity. So, is that going to be a risk transfer? Is it going to be qualified opinion? Is it just like, okay, what is going to be the scope? If says, okay, fine, I did everything and then had someone you know, put a rubber stamp or it kind of a thing. So what are your thoughts there? I mean, how can you even like put together infrastructure? Should it fall under the self-policing umbrella or should it be more in the context of, well, it has to be mandated that similar to you know, federal trust tests and other things like you know, have a third party involvement being some kind of a 
a necessary aspect in the whole notion of AI? Not too surprisingly, I think third party involvement is uh, beneficial. Uh, the, I, I think what we can do is, is bring in outside uh, experience and be able to share what best practices are across institutions. In terms of making it mandatory, I think that's a good idea, just as, as books, a company's books must be audited mm -hmm. and signed off by an auditor, high risk algorithms should have some sort of review by an independent party. The, the exception to that or, or the, the qualification to that is that there probably will end up being a lot of rubber stamping. Mm -hmm. uh, and and different companies have different risk profiles, and they will hire auditors according to those those risk profiles. So this isn't going to solve problems completely, but for institutions that are maybe on the line, there are a lot of institutions who are doing the right thing just because they know that's the right thing to do. I think having some sort of mandatory or some sort of guiding guiding regulation in terms of third party reviews would help push more companies to do the right thing. I, 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 I want to say a few things uh, on, on, uh, based on the experience and, uh, and Nick said the, uh, the, the right things here. We're dealing with the complex stuff and so much things can go wrong and so much detail, right? In, uh, in, the, uh, in my institution, for every Every three model developer, we have one model validator, right? Independent testing, going very deep. So I think the requirement, the things that SR11.7 put so well, is they put the burden on the financial institution to have a strong second line of defense. The independents are critical and they get checked, they get tested and the quality of the challenge, it get tested because it's so many things and very, very complex. And how the third party or regulator, the fifth party in our case, or the fourth party that in our case, can trust the institution or not, depend on a very, very broad criteria and detailed criteria. How's the governance, the qualification of people, the sophistication of the second line of defense, and the, uh, the rigor of the practice that they have. And then they go sample deep certain high risk area, even the low risk area, and they look at it in very detail and challenge. And they're looking at the quality of challenge of the internal team. So I think that's that's the uh, the, the the things that's uh, very, very important. I will be very, very honest here, and a lot of people may not be happy uh, uh, hearing what I said, okay? But when we have third party, Sometimes we, we don't have enough people because of the, uh, uh, the volume. When we have third party, we have to supervise them very, very carefully because the quality, honestly, not as good as our, our model validator. So I think that's uh, very, very challenging here because we pay, we pay people here, right? It's uh, very among the highest paid in the bank, our model validator. And then you try to get the third party consultant to do this, okay? So, so sometimes we have to train them with our standard. We have to monitor it uh, on that. So I think if we're going to go to third party, the, and, and, and it can be very challenging too. You know, we're looking at a regulator, uh, especially the OCC and Federal Reserve that doing all these things very, 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 very well. They have army of PhDs. Looking at model, very detailed, challenging, pointing. So if we have very, very high qualified third party, they're truly independent in the, the uh, acting on the behalf of the good of the society, no conflict of interest. I think that's the right way to do. It's difficult to do that. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, I, I do. It's one, one, one issue I'll take with what, what you're saying is, is uh, Wells Fargo has some of the most brilliant modelers yeah. Yeah. That there are. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, that your third and parties validators. aren't as good, uh, I, 
I, I don't put a lot of weight into that because they're probably way better than certain other institutions. So uh, I, that, that's are, very, um, very good point, Nick. Yeah. I think that my point is that the, the regulator or whatever need to challenge for its company to have very, very mm-hmm. strong team like that. Anything yeah. less than that, it need to get criticized. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And th- that's where I was kind of going with, uh, you know, the segmentation on the requirements for different entities, because I had a, I had a small $100 million dollar bank reach out to me saying, you know, mm. uh, would you want to be on call mm. if we want to validate a model? Because we don't have capacity. And usually we get like a 30 day notice saying we got to get this done in the next month. And there is no way we could have someone mm. waiting for that project to come in. We can't hire like PhD data scientists to basically validate it. But with, with the way the technology is going, we are basically using model as a service. You know, we are having the data robots of the world. We are having model APIs wherein we are trusting someone to like build the, the infrastructure and we are just doing integration work. And we are bringing in, you know, either natural language processing or any kind of, you know, model which has been hosted as a service, right? So the question at that time, at, the, at that point becomes wherein, you know, should the legislation say you got to do something either internally build a force like what Agus is mentioning or have somebody else look at it. But I'm also thinking about the third option wherein it becomes the, the responsibility of the product vendor to actually certify or even have some kind of a, a disclosure saying that this is what we have used, this is what needs to be done in the context of the model, and this is the optimal use cases, and these are the risks associated with the usage of the model in a bad way. And put in, put out, I mean, every company need not go in and do the certification and the validation themselves. Right. It becomes the impetus of the technology yeah. vendor to build out those metrics. Right. I, spoke Patrick, I, 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 I spoke to Patrick. I spoke to Patrick early last week, basically, about the idea, right? to have model testability, mm-hmm. model verifiability, to have a universal API that uh, model need to comply so that it will be testable, verifiable. Here is what I expose to you world out there. Here is that I comply with this API so anybody can test it. So I think we, I, I feel like very, very strongly, I, uh, I spoke to Patrick on this, is I think we need to establish to, to get a trusted artificial intelligence, right, machine learning. We need that kind of universal protocol in the industry that vendor or whoever need to comply. So when Nick has to do testing, it will be uh, everybody that want to interview the model, in, interrogate the model, it can be done. Absolutely. And again, I, I strongly feel about that too. And uh, no marketing plug here, but that's the whole goal of why we're building the Q sandbox in the first place to ensure that there's a sandbox kind of a thing you can test it. Uh, but I'm very interested to hear, uh, Tulsi, I think we have spoken about this too multiple times. What are your thoughts on you know uh, this notion of testability and verifiability of models, uh, especially when, you know, even, on, I mean, I'm, I can go very technical because I teach some of these you know, looking at the model hub or like the TF hub where you have pre-trained models which you are making available versus, uh, you know, APIs wherein the model itself is not exposed, but the API advertises certain things. And I'm in the financial services world, I'm more concerned about some of the alternative data vendors wherein you are basically, you know, kind of saying, okay, I'm just going to call an API and somebody has packaged it to another API and uh, I'm using it for market decisions where I'm going to be trusting somebody's data to make my decisions. As so what are your thoughts to say? Yeah, I mean, I think you know others have alluded to this too. There, I, I actually fully think that there there needs to be you know more services and more approaches for model testing and verifying. Um, you know, both obviously within an organization when you're developing the model, but also actually at the end output when a model is being used, right? And that's especially important for things like APIs where a, a company may test that API on a subset of data, but when it's actually being deployed and used in a different context on a different type of data, um, when a pre-trained model is being taken and then, you know, obviously my loot uh, modified and distilled for a different use case, um, you want to make sure that you're actually validating and testing the model on that use case, right? And really understanding what metrics are coming out at the other side of that funnel. Um, But I think it's also really important then, especially when developing pre-trained models or developing any sort of API that others are going to use, um, 
that there is a certain amount of accountability held and, and set of standards held, right? There needs to be a certain amount of testing done and it needs to be well articulated what that testing is, right? So if you say, hey, my model has achieved a certain accuracy even, um, what does that mean on what type of data, right? What did you test it on? Uh, did you test it on data from a particular region or a particular country? Did you test it on data that represents a particular type of use case or, or user, right? Um, so when you're claiming a particular number or you're saying that your model has been trained for a particular use case, being able to actually articulate the data that was that is behind that evaluation, the metrics and the logistics of what was done and how it was created and for what purpose, then allows any sort of downstream developer to say, okay, I'm gonna take this and just use it, but hopefully there's some implications for, I'm gonna take it and use it, but maybe my use case is drastically different than this other use case. And what does that mean for what I'm testing and validating? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, um, do, you, uh, do you foresee efforts wherein either, you know, uh, players like Amazon, Google, and IBM kind of putting together a standard for their models or wait for regulators to start those efforts or like what August was saying, you know, maybe it's something like the industry should just get together and build a consortium of some sort, wherein we focus on the ones which are relevant to our industries and then put together a specification. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I tend to agree with, with um, Agus a little bit here in that I think like industry by industry, the standards are going to need to look and different because of the, because the users are different, the impacts are different, the risks and the harms are different. Um, there's projects already in flight like about ML and with, through the partnership on AI that are working on trying to develop cross industry standardization, right? And they're working to look at what are different companies like Amazon or Google or Microsoft doing, but also what are specific industries doing and how can we take that and turn that into something that is consistent? I think that anytime we try to build a single standard for every single model or every single industry or every single product, we're going to get it wrong, right? I don't think there is a world in which there is a single standard that actually suffices the needs that are so unique to each of these use cases. But I think there is a world in which we can build sort of a high level notion of the kinds of questions we want to have um, developers companies be accountable to. And then each industry can can start molding that into guidelines that are specific for use cases for that particular vertical. Absolutely. Um, I'm kind of looking at like, where is this whole area going to go, you know, with uh, the frontier areas, right? So, it, you know, we look can look at it the way I see it, you know, we are having a lot of discussion in the context of disclosure, you know, the whole notion of explainability, making things available for others to verify. And all those are things wherein we are talking about trust and transparency and disclosure. But the next level is, you know, the aspects which Agus is mentioning, the validation and the verification aspect of it. And that's where some automation could come in, wherein there are standards, wherein you could say similar to the auto and other areas wherein you have an established standard and you aim to hit that standard, or there is going to be a rating wherein you would say like, you know, this level of, proficiency is achieved, but it could be model specific, it could be categorical in various, you know, uh, some kind of an ordinal way in saying, you know, for these classes of models, you need to hit this level of, you know, uh, accreditation kind of a thing. Uh, but then I'm, I'm kind of looking at the frontier area of risk transfer, you know, wherein, you know, you are expected to, you know, use models and obviously you have to be pragmatic you, if you try to build all the bells and whistles and all the secure aspects, it's, it costs may not be justified if you're doing millions and millions of transactions. So where do you see like the risk transfer come in, wherein uh, will the auditor take the risk or uh, from a legal perspective, maybe, you know, should there be like an insurance product wherein you could say similar to me buying a bike on Walmart, in knowing that it is real and uh, Foursquare is going to cover me for the next four years kind of a thing. In, insurance is a real possibility. Um, I'm, I'm aware of um, two young companies that are looking into insuring AI systems and um, a large, uh, one of the largest reinsurers in the world based out of the EU looking into insuring AI systems. Which other companies, if you may? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm allowed. Oh, I'm, sure. I'm okay. not sure I'm allowed to say, so I'm just, oh, okay. I'm going to play okay. on the cautious side there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I would say that, that I think that that you're right, that eventually I think it will take time, right? I think we see a lot of standards going out, like I'm informally involved in the About ML project and think the AI incident database is incredible, you know, great work coming out of NIST, great work coming out of other places, but it's gonna take time to mature. 
And, and once we understand the standards and once we have technology like the universal testing API that Agus proposed, which I think is just brilliant and super important, um, then, then we will see, and, and, you know, there's cybersecurity insurance. We're going to see an AI system insurance, uh, market evolve. And, and I do think that that's sort of the end goal, right? Like, um, auditing will eventually lead to insurance. Right? So I think that that's where my head goes to tree. Abdul, just, just make sure that you, you don't trans you don't create moral hazard when you do that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I'll try. I'll do um, and, and that's one, that is one uh, thing that I, I've seen as being very effective for handling third party risks, which is that the lenders themselves yes. are uh, liable for them. And, and so what I've seen as results of well, let's say a few years ago, there were a number of third party model providers that were playing loose with laws and everybody found out and, and all of the large institutions said, we're not using you anymore. Well, after that happened, all the third parties started actually doing the work, the model governance work and uh, bringing in auditors and tightening up their systems. And so by having the regulation such that the Wells Fargo, Citibanks, Capital Ones were responsible, it ended up in, it took a couple of years, which I guess is really not a long time, but uh, ultimately these third parties, which are very small companies, which would otherwise not have done that mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. they're now forced into it. Right. Absolutely. So I think we are at one o'clock. Um, maybe we should have a part two of this discussion. I think we didn't really cover <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the topics. I think this is uh, this is fascinating. I mean, like I'm one of those guys who get excited when we talk about risk, uh, which uh, uh, which is my practice, I guess, like in the context of what I've been doing for so long. So how about we take like 30 seconds each about like one thing you want to say about this before we adjourn for today? Um, so, August, you may want to go 30 second pitch on anything. You can say anything for 30 seconds. Well, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to point out on the, uh, on the high risk application. A lot of model will be applied for with have high risk, high impact decision. People need to be responsible. Uh, model cannot be black box. It has to be uh, truly explainable. Perfect. Thank you, August. Patrick? Sure. Um... I think you know one one thing I'll highlight is that people need to start thinking about the legal liabilities of their AI systems for the first time uh, this year. I think anyway, the the FTC shut down an AI company and disgorged the model and the data. So you know, keep in mind that that even common open source packages that you could be using right now may have legal implications. Um, and and I'll I'll leave it at that. So I'm I'm all for um, you know getting us up to the bar of legal AI. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tulsi? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing, plus one to, to what um, both Agus and Patrick just said, but also I think um, these are areas where we're still learning, right? And we're still figuring out what the what right looks like and what good looks like. And so I think be mindful of, of getting the right feedback, right? Get feedback from diverse stakeholders. Make sure that you're bringing in different points of view so that when you're defining what fair means or what robust means or what safe means, um, you're doing so in a way that is comprehensive and then share back those learnings because I think the more that we're all learning from each other, the better our industry standards and the standards that are coming from regulation are likely to be. Absolutely, so Nick. I think, so I absolutely agree with everything and was planning on saying a few of them. So the thing I will be left with is I think I speak for all of us. We're all nerds. We really enjoy the math. We really enjoy the algorithms. It's, it's fun, to, fun to see that stuff happen. But what I want people to think of that are like me, maybe us, is what is the effect? When you put that variable in the model, would you want to be scored on it? Would you want your mother, your father, your friends to be scored on it? And what, what are, you, are you willing to live with the impact of that? And I think if you come from it with that point of view, you're going to make a lot better decisions than if you're just thinking about it. Cool new algorithm. Let's see what, if we can get AUC up by 0001. Absolutely. So I have one 30 second pitch too. Um, I did a search on this whole RFI, not a single word mention of the word ethics. 
um, was the whole document. I, I don't know whether it was a conscious decision, but on the other hand, uh, the WEF put out a whole framework called G or is working on a whole framework called GAI, GAIA, I guess. And they specifically say, apparently they counted 175 frameworks on ethics on AI, which are kind of floating around, um, mostly created by various organizations and various entities. Um, I mean, many of them well-intentioned, right? Uh, the one point I want to make is we got to get pragmatic if the industry has to adopt, especially in a financial engineering setting. Um, so uh, the thought is, uh, while this RFI is a great start, the engagement needs to be there from multiple parties so that uh, everybody comes to the table and have something pragmatic, which could be you know, deployed rather than another ivory framework, which you know, brings in a lot of confusion into the market to figure out like whether we should be in this, this, this versus the other. So a little bit of that, I think we should continue the conversation both online and have another round of discussion as things mature. Um, so thank you so much for taking off your time uh, on a Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday afternoon and for you uh, in the morning, we'll see. Uh, we will continue the discussion again next week. We have uh, Emily um, and Elena talking about evidently uh, and uh, some cool uh, graphics and other things. So uh, please stay in touch and I will see you in another week. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Thanks very much.